Well, I was going to say good morning, but good afternoon. Um, my name is Ellen Marks, and it's an honor to be here on behalf of my family, other victims, and the Environmental Health Trust. First, I am here as the wife of a man struggling with a cell phone-induced brain tumor, and I want to explain my family's deep interest and commitment to this issue. Second, I want to release a shocking document that the Environmental Health Trust has prepared of world actions on cell phone safety, which we have shared with you, and share my deep disappointment regarding how our country lags behind the rest of the world on this issue and the possible reasons as to why this is happening. And I want to share with you some of the personal stories of other families who are coping with tremendous challenges from brain tumors that their physicians believe were induced by their cell phone use, long-term use of cell phones. And sadly, many are already dealing with the loss of loved ones from a brain tumor attributed by their doctors to cell phone use. I'm proud to be here with Dr. Herberman, whose courageous warnings and impeccable scientific credentials have added a tremendous boost to this issue. In 2008, he issued an advisory on safe cell phone use to his faculty and staff, and then we testified together at a congressional hearing on cell phone health risks just four months after my husband's surgery. Despite the hearing being the same week as the financial meltdown and the bailout, headline news in D.C. that morning was that the CTIA refused to testify. It's painful to think how many lives we have, have been exposed over the past three years while the public continues to be intentionally misled by industry and our regulatory agencies. It is apparent that local and state governments like you, who are to be commended for your foresight, must take the lead to correct this possible catastrophe. We cannot afford to wait. My husband of 31 years has a malignant brain tumor that experts believe was caused by his long-term use of cell phones. Alan began using a cell phone in 1987 when we were a happy, hard-working family with three small children. Alan stated, that if someone had told me that holding the phone right next to my head could result in a death sentence, I never would have played Russian roulette with it. How can they knowingly market a product that can rob a man of his life and not warn him? On May 5, 2008, my husband and I excitedly packed to leave for our youngest child's college graduation. Instead, at 2 a.m., I awoke to Alan's strange noises and thrashing. I tried to wake him but couldn't, and the nightmare has yet to end. Witnessing a grand mal seizure is something you can never erase from your memory. At 4 a.m., we were told that my lifelong love had a large mass in his right frontal lobe, the part of the brain that allows us to differentiate between right and wrong and relate to those we love. For several years, he had been exhibiting unexplainable behavior that caused emotional chaos in our family. Alan desperately tried to continue to be a loving husband and father as he willingly sought professional help and took antidepressants and bipolar medications to no avail, as it was not a psychiatric disorder, but a lethal brain tumor. Ten days after Alan's diagnosis, Senator Kennedy had a seizure with the same diagnosis, and ironically, our son had interned for the senator in his private office. My son came to me after hearing a report that the Kennedy family felt his glioma may be related to his cell phone use, and said, Mom, it can't be just a coincidence. Dad and the senator were both glued to their cell phones. I was stunned as Alan's cell phone was a vital part of his work, always held to the side of the head where the tumor developed. Alan and Senator Kennedy had their skulls cut open about days apart. Alan's craniotomy lasted seven hours and titanium now holds his skull in place and the tumor will grow back. I immersed myself in research on cell phones and brain tumors and was shocked and outraged at what I found. I sent worldwide experts Alan's medical records and cell phone records. Many experts agreed with Dr. Elihu Richter, head of occupational environmental medicine at Hebrew University Hadassah School of Medicine, whose research calculates risk assessment of exposure to radiation, including cell phones. He stated that the weight of the evidence suggests it is more likely than not that there is a cause and effect that Marx's, between Marx's cell phone use and his glioma. This is consistent with the emerging body of knowledge on exposure, latency, and laterality of cell phone use. He went on to say, more frighteningly, we cannot exclude the possibility that even with less than 10 years of use, these tumors may appear in those with very high exposures. Dr. May Swickert at the FDA, now at the CTIA, gave cell phones a free pass from the required testing of all radiation-emitting devices when they were released in the United States in 1983. 
Months later, he went to work for Motorola, setting precedents for the cozy relationship and revolving door between industry and the federal agencies mandated to regulate cell phone radiation that continues to this day. This has the potential of becoming a public health catastrophe the likes of which we have never experienced, as malignant gliomas and salivary gland tumors, which Dr. Herberman spoke about, are lethal and cell phone use in the United States has escalated dramatically. According to Pew Research, children as young as six use cell phones, and greater than four out of five children and teens 12 years and older sleep with their phones on next to them, often under the pillow. Even the President's cancer panel states that special caution is prudent, as children will have a lifetime of exposure. This past May, the World Health Organization and the International Agency for Research on Cancer, their expert arm, advised enlisted cell phone radiation, a possible human carcinogen based on an increased risk of gliomas associated with wireless phone use. That is the exact cancer that afflicted my husband, Senator Kennedy, Johnny Cochran, Seve Ballesteros, and many others. To ignore this declaration as, be, as being done in the United States currently is a horrible disservice to all of us. As it should be, microwave radiation from cell phones joins a long list of well-reviewed cancer agents that includes engine exhaust, DDT, lead, and gasoline exhaust fumes. Despite the possible carcinogen, carcinogen classification, our FCC and FDA have taken no steps to communicate the importance of this to our citizens. Shockingly, their websites continue to use outdated information, which is a betrayal of public trust and a threat to many lives. The CTAA likes to hang their hats on our government agencies who are seemingly captured by this industry and are still wrongly claiming there are no adverse health effects from cell phone use, while hundreds of studies have shown definitive health risks, including producing defective offspring in animals related to cell phone use. We desperately need warnings. Supposedly, the FCC, after consultation with the FDA, OSHA, and EPA, adopted standards governing, governing radio frequency emissions from cell phones. And the FCC asserts that those standards represent the best science to protect public health. However, the standards were not set directly by the FCC, as they do not have the biological ex or scientific expertise, but by industry-dominated, non-government agencies decades ago. One of those agencies, the American National Standard Institute, decided in the mid-1980s that they no longer would be involved in health safety standards because of the possibility of lawsuits, since these standards may be unduly influenced by parties with commercial interests. The current standard, SAR, has serious limitations as it ignores all biological effects of non-ionizing radiation, such as the glioma my husband has. The SAR fails to take into account that hundreds of studies have proven damage from below heating levels, and the SAR is based on heating. Phones are now tested on a plastic dummy with the head the size of a six foot 200 pound man, characteristic of a small majority of our population. To make matters worse, the manufacturers are left to report the results from the so-called independent testing facilities to the FCC themselves. Dr. Om Gandhi, chair of the Department of Electrical Engineering at the University of Utah and also a past Motorola consultant who was on the original committee to set the standards for RF devices, states that industry has played around with the way in which cell phones are tested as they test them up to a half an inch from the ear with a spacer, which was industry's idea, and up to an inch from the body. This may seem like a small distance, but for radiation from a cell phone, it is enormous. If held at the body, you are absorbing up to 375% more radiation than the way in which the phone is tested. In tiny font, the iPhone manual tells you, as Representative Brown stated, that the SAR measurement may exceed the FCC exposure guidelines if the device is kept closer than 5 eighths of an inch from the body. The BlackBerry is more incredible, and it says to maintain compliance with FCC exposure guidelines when you carry the device on your body, keep it at least 0.98 inches from the body, especially the abdomen of a pregnant woman and the lower abdomen of a teenager, while their advertisements tell you to keep your friends in your pocket. The manual also tells you to limit use while they offer you free unlimited minutes. 
quite a contradiction. While this language is being hidden in the manuals and the industry f is fighting simple precautionary measures, it worries many of us how much more they know and are not telling us. And while the FCC maintains on their website that cell phones are safe and they list precautions which they do not endorse, they insist that manufacturers place that safe distance warning in every manual. Are you confused? Perhaps that is the intent. In a very recent article about the studies proving cell phones kill and damage sperm, John Wall, CTIA spokesperson, person, did not comment on the sperm studies, but cautioned that organizations like the World Health Organization and the FDA have concurred that wireless devices are not a public health risk, and the peer-reviewed scientific evidence has overwhelmingly indicated that wireless devices within the limits established by the FCC do not cause any adverse health effects. The World Health Organization statement on their website now is contradictory to the IARC statement classifying cell phones and possible carcin carcinogen, and the World Health Organization does receive money from industry. They were the ones that did the Interphone study, which was industry funded. And the United States, the CTIA, belongs to an organization worldwide that puts money into that. So, as you can see from the worldwide advisory recommendation handout, many nations such as Finland, France, Russia, Israel, India, Brazil, and others have legislated for warnings or advised their citizens of precautions and banned the marketing and sales of cell phones to children, while the United States remains suspiciously quiet and the FCC and FDA and even the WHO, remarkably, say no problem. The FCC webpage, The Kids Zone, currently lists the question, do cell phones cause cancer? And the answer reads, there is no evidence leaking cell phone use to cancer. Just yesterday, the Israeli Ministry of Education bans cell phones in schools, and students will be taking lessons on what they call wise cell phone use. Our children and grandchildren deserve the same protection as other children around the globe. On the Dr. Oz show, my 25-year-old daughter spoke eloquently of her dad, her best friend, and how at her brother's wedding she prayed her dad will be there to walk her down the aisle. She also stated that her generation uses only cell phones. They began using them as teens, and if other parents were like us, we would not pay for the extra fees that they then charged for texting, forcing our children to hold the phone to their still-developing brains. Now, yes, they text more often, but they sleep with them on or near their heads and keep them on in their pockets, which is not the way they are tested. And some are even keeping them in their bras, which I have talked to a breast cancer specialist who has seen unusual breast tumors in women who are doing this. Considering excellent studies show that cell phone use kills and damages sperm and is a possible carcinogen, my daughter's generation certainly does deserve the right to know this other than what is in the fine print. Those opposed to warnings about safe cell phone use feel doing so would challenge the United States government's determination on wireless device safety. My colleagues and I agree, and let's bring on that challenge now before it is too late. Scientists' warnings about tobacco and asbestos were long suppressed and ignored, fueled by sophisticated campaigns such as the one we are seeing now with cell phones. In a country where a drug cannot be launched without its safety subjected to the deepest scrutiny, the idea that mobile phones can be used by children without warnings is a double standard gone mad. In a moment, I'd like to introduce you, if the projector works, to some of the people that I've come to know and love as I've spoken out about, uh, I have spoken out about this issue over the past three years, and many of them have reached out to me. These are just a few of the many. Please listen closely to the words, hopes, and losses of those who live with or have lost loved ones to this insidious disease which doctors believe was caused by their long-term use of cell phones. I would like to thank the committee, Chairman Sterla, Representative Brown, and the other representatives that have traveled here today for your willingness to educate yourselves on this critical issue. You are pioneers, and that is greatly appreciated. Um, I would also like to make a couple of comments from what I've heard here today. Um, first of all, Mr. Keegan mentioned the Interphone study, which was done by the World Health Organization. Um, that study was finished about six years ago, and the results were mysteriously not released for about six years. 
And then when they were released, the findings that showed an increased risk, a 118% increased risk of glioma 